Hey everybody and happy Monday. Um, it's the first Monday of June. It's June 3rd. It's my sister's birthday. Happy birthday. Um, yeah, so uh, how's everybody been doing? How was your weekend? Um, mine was actually great. Um, you guys heard me on Friday morning gushing about the fact that I was going to go see Godzilla and I saw Godzilla. Um, if you saw my tweet full of exclamation points afterwards, um, it's because I really freaking liked it. Um, this week I'm going to be recording a review of it with the guys over at Geeks with Shields, so you can hear my full thoughts there, but I'll just give a brief um, thing here because this is something very important. Nostalgia is an interesting thing, and um, I feel like we all showed up for Michael Bay's first Transformers movie. And his first Transformers movie isn't all that bad. But the sequels really are. Um, and I've heard a couple of critics who, you know, I won't call out for being wrong because reviews are, you know, exactly that. They're, they're your views. It's your opinion. But they've been comparing this thing to a Michael Bay movie with big lizards. Now, Michael Bay makes action films, right? This is an action film. This is a giant monster film. This isn't high art. It is not, well, let's say, this isn't high art from a filmmaking, writing standpoint. This is, however, in my opinion, high art in a visual and visceral experience that is both fan service while at the same time being completely new and a visual palette we've never seen used for Godzilla. And... In comparison, the 2014 Godzilla, I actually really dig that movie. I dig that movie a lot. Um, I feel like the movie's slower parts, which is the majority of the film, kind of earn an atmosphere that when Godzilla shows up and does more badass things than we've ever seen Godzilla do up to that point, fully IMAXed and realized in really, really great um, digital fashion. And I actually really dig the new look of Godzilla for the American versions. Um, that 15 minutes or so of that two hour long movie was absolutely fucking awesome. And I feel like there's a movie there too that the biggest problems that movie had is they forgot to make an interesting movie using the Jaws approach. The Jaws approach being it'll hit harder if you see it less. Um, this movie does not have that problem. Um, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Um, it and I said this is my hot take and I still believe this and I went back to watch um, Mad Max Fury Road just to make sure I really meant this now Mad Max Fury Road I feel was Best Picture Academy Award winning level um, for the approach it was given but at the exact same time it is doing the same thing that this Godzilla King of the Monsters film is doing it's taking a very known very niche genre and celebrating it for two plus hours on screen with a fast paced we're delivering story and nuance and layers while all the action action is happening and does this Godzilla movie have tropes and characters that show up in every other movie like this? Yeah but in my opinion they're the best possible fucking version of tropes and characters and things like that um, also you know Millie Bobby Brown from Stranger Things is she's great. She's there and she's playing a role that should have been a throwaway role and five years ago probably would have been played by a boy. And she's nailing it. Um, she's the emotional centerpiece of the human side of the story. And again, this isn't friggin', you know, um, Godfather level storytelling. This is Godzilla level storytelling. This is very, very much um, action for action's sake big large explosions for explosion's sake, but god damn it if they aren't fucking incredible, and god damn it if it's not everything we've ever wanted to see in a Godzilla movie, so when I go back to talking about the Michael Bay comparison, it's not to knock Michael Bay down, it's to say that we show up for his films, we understand that a brand and with that director, you're going to get a certain thing, sometimes the quality is really low, sometimes you get the rock, Do you know what I mean, and so if we're going to show up for Transformers movie out of nostalgia, even though the reviews are terrible, like the later ones, then why are we going to let 
so-so, like 50-50 reviews on a Rotten Tomatoes score affect us from showing up for a movie that, as far as the trailers have told us, and as far as critics like Movie Bob, my brother, and um, some other people out there that I've seen just having a complete visceral reaction of, oh my God, this is everything I ever wanted. I can't be objective about this. You know, um, why wouldn't we show up for that? Because if you don't show up for it, they're not going to make them. Remember, filmmakers, directors, people that are fans, of course, are going to keep trying to make the movies they want to make. But if a studio doesn't want to support the movie that they want to make, it's never going to make its way to you. It's a supply and demand kind of thing. And if you're going to shit on the focus groups and everything else, the focus groups told them that we wanted a Godzilla movie with non-stop balls to the wall action and larger than life recreations of characters that we've come to love. And I say that characters, you know, these monsters don't talk doesn't mean they don't have personality and character um there's a reason why in the end credits they list Godzilla Rodan King Ghidorah and Mothra as himself and herself credits it's because the this isn't aping something this is another time where your favorite characters have shown up on screen this is a celebration and a love letter to everything that's come before it, and I would put it right up there with the best cinematic versions of these characters. I am not going to put it above the Toho originals, the same way I would never put a remake um, above an original movie, but God damn it, if it doesn't just stand right up there with them, is going, you know what, here you go, here you go, and you know what, fuck it, I'll just say it, being from Boston, getting to see giant monsters traipsing around in a city that I know very well, particularly with Fenway Park, um, is an absolute friggin' joy. Please go see this movie. I want Godzilla vs. Kong to actually come out. I'm hearing rumblings that they might be affecting release date and stuff like that because of this one underperforming. Um, anyway, uh, get out there. Make this movie a big deal. Um, but not, not in spite of anything else, right? If you really liked Aladdin and you're going to go see Aladdin a second time, great. Go out there and enjoy the product that people are making for you. Have your own opinions. Don't show up or not show up just based on a Rotten Tomatoes score, but also read those reviews. See what other people think. It's going to help you form your opinion. It might help you see things that you haven't seen. So until later this week, that's all I have to say about Godzilla King of the Monsters. Let's move on to Cobra fucking Kai. Um, I started watching it. Me and my wife and our my sister-in-law um, went to the theater and saw the premiere of the first season. Um, absolutely loved the first season. And season two is just as good. Um, it does this incredible job of balancing nostalgia and a new story. Um, the score kind of overarching idea that, you know, um, Johnny might be representing kind of like the MAGA America, or at least Kreese and Cobra Kai kind of represent that, and um, that, uh, wow, the Karate Kid there, Daniel-san, uh, might be representing, you know, the more liberal, progressive version of America, but neither one of them really have it right, um, and they're learning from each other is a really, really cool play on how to do this in nowadays world. The kids are still kids. They're vulgar. They beat the shit out of each other. Um, they have high school drama, real world drama. Um, I was thinking about this last night when I was thinking about the show. A cool correlation I have from it is bring ourselves back to the early 80s and back to the future. Back to the Future had this storyline where it's flashing back to the 1950s and it's a very film like happy days version of the 1950s and I love that about the Back to the Future movies that the world that they travel to whether it's the past or the future is a very cinematic very pop culture influenced version it's almost like looking at it through um through nostalgic cloudy eyes right and I'd say Cobra Kai gets that Cobra Kai has shit tons of callbacks to the original show, but they never feel unplaced or unwarranted. It feels like almost Back to the Future is a movie that we're not just flashing back to the movie, we're flashing back to an entire era. 
And this show is celebrating that entire era. And I really mean it. It's easy to look at stuff like this through cynical eyes. But YouTube and, um, and the folks making the Cobra Kai show, which Ralph Macchio and William Zabka, who were Johnny and Daniel's son in the original show, are executive producers, they're 100% on board. And the way they escalated and then ended this season, this show seems to write its seasons like episodes of 24. Like, they, they give you tons of story and tons of character development and then bring their big world-switching thing in the last couple episodes, and they leave you at a real high point. Um, and I love that about it. Um, this could be my favorite thing on TV. Um, this and Stranger Things, easily. Um, and Bob's Burgers. Can't forget that. So, please, um, check out Cobra Kai. Um, it's worth it. <clears throat> Next, over the weekend... Me and my wife and my uh, my two kids, Ava and Jake, my wife is Sarah from the Creating Geeks podcast, went to Southwick's Zoo. Now, those of you that don't know Massachusetts all that well, we've got shit tons of stuff all around the Boston area, but the suburbs outside of Boston get very woody and uh, woodsy and have a lot of um, trails and things the further you get out of the city. Um, and then you go out more towards western southern western mass like Menden which is where the drive-in we go to is and we have been seeing ads for Southwick Zoo now we've got two zoos near us one of them is Franklin Park Zoo and Franklin Park is right in the middle of Dorchester and Roxbury which are more of like the hard um, urban areas of the Boston suburbs but you still got you know a beautiful huge zoo in the middle of it Stone Zoo is in Stoneham which is a little bit less of a hard, tumble suburb of Boston, but it's still weird that there's a zoo there. And so you got both of these things. Well, Southwick Zoo is out in Menden, which is basically in the middle of nowhere. And it is absolutely wonderful. We had never been. It's huge. The types of animals, they have freaking rhinoceroses at this place. My daughter went absolutely ape shit. But the coolest thing about Southwick Zoo is that they've got an area called the Deer Forest. And what they've done is they've carted off a few acres of this place and let it be just naturally how it was. You know, there's a swamp, there's trees. It's fenced in, but you can't see that part of it. And you walk in through, you know, the double door fence so the animals can't get out. And then it's just deer and other wild animals roaming free. Free. Um, kind of like a safari. And they've got zookeepers in there to make sure you're being, you know, safe with them. But they give you corn and stuff to feed them. And you stand there in the walkway and the deer just cross your path. They come up to you. They want to be pet. My daughter was surrounded by like five, ten deer at one point. She lost her mind. Um, this is such a cool interactive way to do an exhibit like this. And I love this zoo for it. Um, since I didn't do this at the beginning... Um, I'm the Chippa at the Chippa on Twitter. You can find um, my podcast, the Chipman Brothers Tangent, Creating Geeks, the Talk Buster podcast, and Shooting the Shit with Chippa on um, Patreon.com forward slash the Chippa. Um, all of those things in this are supported by donations to that Patreon. Um, you get episodes of those shows three days early if you're a member, and other cool things. Just go to the tiers and check it out. Um, I'm also giving away a Blockbuster sweatshirt similar to this one next to me, but signed by the entire crew of the last Blockbuster on the planet in Bend, Oregon. Um, it's also signed by the general manager, Sandy Harding, who you've heard on this show, and Ken Tischer, who's the franchise owner that's been there from the beginning to now. Um, I think it's a great keepsake. Get me to 350 bucks, and one of you lucky people is going to get it. And at $300, it's also 20 stickers for the last blockbuster on the planet that I'm going to give out as well. Um, what else do I have to say? Um, I'm going to start doing two episodes a week every once in a while. You've probably seen that happen. This is of the podcasts, you know, this, this one I do every business day, as it were. Um, so be checking that out and just, you know, help spread the word, help this get out there. Um, I'm only as good as you guys make me out to be. Um, so with that, this has been The Chippa. I'll see you guys on the other side.